Hello, everybody. Uh, great to see you all here. Uh, I am Sibran. I work at the Blender Institute as a Blender developer. Before this, I did my PhD in crowd simulation, crowd animation at uh, Utrecht University. And as such, I was asked by Tom to be uh, the, 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 how you say, the chair or the, the for this panel. Um, we're talking about sci scientific visualization with Blender. Um, so we have five great speakers here who are going to talk about what they are doing, what the research is, how they use Blender. And afterwards, I would love to have a little bit of a discussion about um, Blender in particular or open source in general in the academic world. Like, what does your university do with it? Uh, how do you think it could benefit or how maybe it's rubbish for, for academia? I don't know. It's always good to, to fight back and forth a little bit. Um, so let me introduce in order, I think, of database ID on the website. <laughs> uh, we have Paul Mendes, who is working as a visualization group leader at Surf Sarah here in Amsterdam. We have Adam Kallis, who is a, a computer scientist at the Friedrich Alexander University Erlangen Nuremberg. We have uh, Marwan Abdella, uh, who works at the Blue, Blue Brain Project in APFL. Mike Simpson, research software engineer at Newcastle University. And then there is uh, Peter Strakos, researcher and developer at IT for Innovations. Thank you very much, gentlemen, and thanks for being here. And I will give the word to Marwan. Well, thank you. So can you hear me? Well, thank you very much. I'm uh, very excited, uh, motivated, and very happy to be here, actually, at my first Blender conference. And um, I'm here to show um, and share my experience with using Blender to, uh, to see neurons and how just a spark of an idea has turned into, uh, uh, I, I won't say a complete product, but at least it's like an add-on that I can say, like many neuroscientists now started using it into de developing their um, images that they need for scientific publications or to analyze even neurons or for artists to generate meshes out of it. So uh, I can just start with this one. Scientific visualization of brain like 100 years ago was something like exactly like this. So uh, before even, way, time, way, way before the uh, time of open sourcing, this guy was just using his microscope to see uh, the individual, uh, the, the shapes of individual neurons uh, using certain uh, staining technique called Golgi staining. So this is how we used to see the brain 100 years ago or even more. Later, like a, a decade, uh, a century later, or even more, we have had a spectrum of different imaging technologies which would allow us actually to see way more detailed objects inside the brain. So that simple thing, this is the, uh, the brain of a, uh, a rat, a uh, two weeks old rat. So this simple three-dimensional object that is almost the size of the uh, palm of the hand has turned out to be a galaxy. We can see way more than just, you know, uh, something with the size of the palm of the hand. And if we just use like some sort of optical microscope, let's say the bright field microscope, we can do some experiments in the lab with which we can reconstruct three-dimensional, uh, I won't say models, but more like samples, points. And then if we just try to see, uh, to segment the stack, we can end up with something like this. And this is basically a shape of like a rough skeleton of a neuron. From then, we define uh, a morphology, a neuronal morphology, with which we can identify the soma or the cell body, that thing in, 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 uh, in yellow, and the different points along the morphology. And if we just connect these points, we call them samples, we end up having sections, and if we connect uh, segments, sorry, and if we connect the segments, we end up having sections. And the connecting the sections together, we can identify or define at least the, uh, the, the arborization of the different neurons. So we have many, many different shapes or many, many different morphologies of these neurons in our brains. 
and they are extremely complicated, ugly, arborized, like very long, having like huge spatial extent with while they are very thin. So trying to really visualize them, it's not just a matter of like making like a three-dimensional plot or even a 2D plot on paper because at the end you might see nothing. So what you have to do is to develop a technology or a way, like a novel method where you can really allow the scientists to visual, have a visual appeal to see exactly what these morphologies uh, are about. And these are, for example, like two <laughs> common methods that people uh, might use to visualize uh, morphologies uh, using even uh, the um, WebGL, where they can just label and do some, some coloring like this to identify the different arborization or the different arbors. But it's still, it's, it's something very basic. So the approach we have followed, the blue brain, is like, OK, what about we using Blender? So let's just give it a try. And from then, it was the spark, the idea of building Neuromorphovis, which has turned into a, like a complete plugin as a tool. Or I, I won't say just a tool, maybe a framework, because it's combined of several toolboxes together, as I'm uh, going to show later. And I just wanted to use this, sorry, in the beginning because my advisor was just telling me how can we reconstruct uh, realistic shapes or like plausible uh, somata with plausible shapes. So I only wanted to use Blender just to give it a try as an open source tool, easy to uh, make a prototype out of, but then it had, I, had int I have integrated these other toolboxes that we can use Neuromorphovis to do morphology visualization, visual analytics, we can even use Blender to repair and edit the morphology skeletons, and we can use the different meshing uh, APIs to in, in order to reconstruct uh, meshes out of them. And finally, we can use the tool to produce media out of them in an automatic way. So this is just the architecture of the, the underlying architecture of Neuromorphovis, but I'm not going to really go into any details here. This is just a very simple interface. And we wanted to make the experience kind of seamless that if a user doesn't know how to use Blender, he can still use the plugin very easily. So we designed on this uh, left side the, the different panels, which would allow the user just, you know, with just simple clicks to, to visualize and to see the different labels of the morphologies and to pick colors and even to do dif uh, different reconstruction me uh, methods, apply different reconstruction methods or uh, try to change the quality of the neuron, or try to change radii, and so on and so forth. And these are, for example, different methods where we can reconstruct the neuron morphology and just analyze them quickly. And we can also control the geometry, trying to change the radii in order to see something on the complete, the global uh, uh, scope, or just uh, something that is very specific to certain block. We can also try to control the branching order with just very simple uh, uh, like clicks, the user can do a lot of uh, a lot of stuff, and we can select certain branches to visualize, which would which would you know, change the shape of the somata, and also we can use different methods to sketch the morphologies. For example, the zigzag mode here, we can generate meshes that we can use to generate volumes, which would give us something as we can see it exactly under the microscope. And also, I have added a simple analysis toolbox, which with one single click, a user can analyze entirely the different aspects of the morphology. And it's not just on a global scope, but even for different arbors individually, as you can see here. And also, we can use uh, the editing capabilities in Neuron, which we can switch to the edit mode. And then if there's like a f an, an issue with some sample, I can just select it. And then we give the user the, uh, the, the ability to just move, navigate, and then you can just repair one single sample that was mistaken to, to make the, uh, the correct shape of the morphology. And also the somata, many people just use spheres, which like something very basic. So we wanted to give the user some more, uh, you know, realistic, plausible shape. So we have used the soft body physics and the, uh, uh, phys the, the physics engine and the, the mass spring uh, models in Blender to be able to reconstruct realistic somata that way. And so also we give the user the, uh, the, the flexibility to change parameters and see the different shape of the somata for one single neuron. So this is the different shapes for 55 different neurons. We just show how do they start from one, sing one single sphere with different sizes and we end up having different shapes. Then we use also different meshing methods to be able to reconstruct 
convert this into this, like reconstruct highly plausible and realistic m meshes out of the uh, samples we are getting from the reconstructions. We have used the Boolean operators, mainly the union operator, and the skinning modifiers, and also we have used the metaballs to reconstruct different meshes. So I'm not just, I'm quickly, I'm just going to show how can we convert, you know, one simple morphology into a very nice mesh at the end, the different steps. So using different toolboxes from Blender, bridging, bridging, and then we just smooth and we apply the shader and we end up having nice mesh like this. And also the, like different kind of materials we have integrated into the, the, the plugin with which we can use to automatically generate these nice renderings. So, and then we have used Blender to generate highly realistic, uh, sorry, uh, artistic uh, images for scientific publications. So that was one of our colleagues. The neurons, they do look very nice with just few clicks that we can get from the morphologies. And these are some uh, renderings that we have just generated from, from the tool as well. So just to make sure that I'm on time, the tool has been open sourced and it's available on GitHub. And it has been tested on the, 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 the different platforms, which is working fine. And this is just one email I would like to share uh, that I've received it from, from some guy who's th thanking me for developing this tool. But actually, this is uh, something that I have to pay it forward to the Blender community. Because I would say, without, the, without Blender, this thing would have, would have never been there. And um, using Blender to do something like, like this was completely, the API was very well documented. I have managed to use it in a way that would, would very simple to, to, to really build this thing in just only a few months. And I've got like many users now who like, you know, keep saying that, okay, we are very happy to use Blender and to use this tool in, in our work. So thank you very much. Other? Yes. Just a simple question. I saw this was the 2.79. Yes, that yeah. actually because we have developed this pretty much. I started doing this like a year and a half ago before 2.8 was announced. You are going to update? But, but now we are, we are, I'm actually working on an update for, okay. for this that's, with, with, with 2.8. But I Thank can you. still say that it's the it performance wise and sort of features is still kind of complete. So just the move is to be, you know, updated. That's it. Thank you. Uh, I didn't really understand if you uh, kind of um, uh, do that uh, in-game, real-time uh, to, to connect them, to do this uh, um, bridging of, yeah, this bridging thing. of these Yeah, depths. this is completely automated. I just use the, the, the Blender API where I can find where um, the branches would intersect with the reconstructed SOMA. And then I just label the, the faces and I use the edge loops where I can just bridge, you know, the face, one face mm. on the side of the Soma, one face on the side of the Arbor, and then they, they turn to something like this. And then I just use one smoothing step, so it turns into a complete, uh, you know, one single object out of it. So uh, when you want to make the, the uh, any, like more smooth, uh, more curvy, uh, do you run into problems with the smoothing? Because I always uh, uh, notice this behavior in bl Blender, of course, uh, when I smoothed it, that uh, things get incredibly thin, but didn't get It hurt. depends on the algorithm. Sometimes if you yes. use a scanning modifier, for example, yes, you might end up to something like this. But if you use something like, like the metaballs, it will never happen. Oh, yeah. So it depends on which, that's why we have implemented different mission techniques with which to give the, if you have something that is really very bendy sort of shape, you can still get something that is not uh, intersecting or anything like this. Uh, just another question, uh, the segmentation itself, uh, is that something that's also part of the software? No, 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 no. It's we we right. just get skeletons that mm. are segmented by, because that's a huge problem yes. in neuroscience. <laughs> it's not just a problem to be solved mm. that way. So that's, we got just get the skeletons in standard file formats, mainly what's called SWC file format, and then we turn it that, that way. Thanks. Any more questions? If not, then let's switch over to Peter. This is for... Uh, so we'll just use... Okay. 
this is yours. Thank you very much. on. Okay, hello everyone once again and I have been already introduced so I would uh, go directly to the topic I would like to present here. So um, at our facility uh, we have focused on scientific data visualizations um, using Blender and Kovice. So just briefly go through what is scientific visualization? Well, usually it's a kind of uh, scientific phenomena. You usually compute on large systems and after the computation of such simulation, you want to somehow uh, visualize the results. Uh, what you can see can be considered, uh, I mean the images, as a, a result of some kind of scientific uh, data. And there is quite a lot of tools available already for uh, this kind of uh, visualizations. Uh, namely, all of you probably know Perview or other stuff like Visit, PMD, Paper, and or also Kovice. And this tool we decided to choose because uh, it has uh, quite a lot of important stuff. Uh, we uh, focused on because we work in a uh, supercomputing center. So just briefly uh, introduce you to uh, the Kovice so you can have uh, uh, an idea what is it about and how we decided to use it. So Kovice uh, stands for a collaborative uh, visualization and simulation environment. So basically uh, right now it's uh, already uh, released and uh, as an uh, open source. So this is quite important fact for us. And it's uh, it has started its development in early 80s. And uh, it offers users quite a lot of functionalities. Uh, as I said, uh, you can do simulations, uh, post-processing of the data and also visualizations. But we uh, decided to uh, replace the visualization uh, possibilities of uh, Kovice uh, itself by Blender. And uh, as for inner structure of uh, Kovice, uh, so we can better uh, uh, have better idea how it works and what are the similarities to Blender. So it can be uh, usefully used uh, within the Blender. So it has um, some uh, kind of uh, user interface uh, where you can operate with lots of modules. And those modules um, serve as uh, uh, basically tools that process the data. Uh, you can load the data, uh, do uh, some processing of the data and also the visualization, uh, but uh, that's the part we decided to uh, left for Blender. And what is also very important for us is that um, uh, as for the uh, computation, which is done uh, with those modules, uh, it can be spread on uh, not just the local uh, machines, but also on remote machines. So, uh, this is quite convenient uh, for a supercomputer. And of course there is or there are uh, mechanisms that then share the data from uh, the remote uh, workstations. So you can basically uh, control the modules so you can set them up and then uh, uh, share the data from each individual module. And it doesn't matter whether it's uh, running uh, locally or remotely. So uh, that was for Kovice and we decided to join the forces of uh, Kovice and Blender. Uh, on one side Blender as a 2D or and 3D studio and Kovice as a data, data analyzer. And 
we have started to create a kind of new editor in Blender. Uh, we call it uh, Kovice Editor. And it uh, shares the same kind of workflow uh, as is in Kovice. So it means it's a network of uh, modules, or in Blender it's nodes, or R nodes. So it's a network of uh, connected nodes uh, that process the data up to the visualization. And yeah, we try to uh, seamlessly integrate uh, this new editor into the Blender. And uh, uh, it's, or the status of our uh, work is that uh, it's a part of the Blender as a modified version of Blender. And it's already in version 2.8. And here is how it looks in the uh, Blender environment. So basically, you have a new kind of uh, editor, uh, the Kovice editor in a selection of editor types. And yeah, here is kind of structure you can get uh, using this kind of editor. Basically, uh, you have set of nodes which you interconnect between each other. Uh, on one end, you have uh, some uh, I.O. module that reads uh, the uh, data from some, uh, some uh, computations. Uh, over there, uh, it's a, a node for reading inside uh, data. And then you can process the data uh, to the goal you want to reach, uh, up to the visualization or up to the last block, which uh, turns the uh, data into geometry in a Blender. Yeah, and here is a short video of uh, how it can work. So here you can see uh, an example. It's a Tatra uh, car, uh, the old one. And yeah, here is the structure of nodes which uh, basically uh, loads the uh, computed data. And it's uh, from a CFD simulation. So uh, you can, for example, visualize the streamlines uh, from the computed data. And you can mix with the functionality of Blender, which is already there, and basically uh, use some uh, start and end node uh, for the streamlines uh, and move the points so the streamlines can be moved and precisely cover the car as they were computed before. You can also switch to different uh, type of analysis. Right now uh, on the car there is a uh, visualization of pressure distribution and you can basically uh, do mm, from their animations. You can uh, you can push it further and create uh, some nicely looking visualizations using uh, cycles uh, from Blender and so on and so on. Yeah. So basically, that was it. Uh, what I would I wanted to show you, and it's still work in progress. So. Thank you, and if you have any questions, just ask, and here are some more examples from, from our plugin or from our Kovice editor in Blender. Thank you. Hi, that's, that's really interesting. Um, but where do you obtain data like the car on the bottom left? Uh, as I said, we work in uh, National Supercomputing Center and we have lots of colleagues who does computations, uh, CFD analysis, structural analysis, and basically they are our source of data and basically, or hopefully, they are also our users, users of such tool so they can better visualize or prepare uh, some stuff for presentations uh, of the computed results. So the data comes mainly from 
our colleagues who does mm -hmm. CFD and other stuff, other analysis. Yeah. Yeah, but, so but that's not the model itself. It's just it. It's more the um, uh, the way the the air moves or it's the aerodynamics which are computed yep. but uh, I think uh, the car itself you can load in any kind of car or any kind of model and and uh, put your scientific data in and see it, it's the model is not computed it's the the waves which are computed Right. Yeah, but yes. uh, the waves are computed based on the model based which is the in model. there. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So any model, you can use any model and you see... Uh, well, yeah, but you have flow. to first compute it. You have to compute the model first. Yeah. Then. Okay, so you have... Uh, yeah, yeah okay. so they compute basically everything and then they want to visualize the results. Okay. And this is possibility how they can do it. So it's the car and... Yeah, all the stuff. Okay. Uh, I, I will. Yeah, this is uh, my I'm colleague. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, uh, I am the second guy on the first page. Uh, the, <laughs> uh, the data come from OpenFOAM and it was calculated on supercomputer. It took very, very long time, few hours on several nodes. And this is the visualization which comes from the uh, cluster. The, the data, the result data uh, are very big, like uh, to several hundred gigabytes or terabytes, and we are able this uh, data show direct in the blender. Uh, that's all. Hi. Hello. Uh, very interesting. I'm just wondering why did you need a custom build of Blender for this? Can you, in theory, create it as a plugin, which well, uh, will uh, easy the yeah, distribution? Yeah, it would be much easier for users, I agree. Uh, but because we needed to create special data types and so on, so as a first, let's say, trial, it was easier for us because we have C++ developers uh, in our side, it was easier to create special build of Blender. Yeah. Uh, and did you have plan uh, to transform it into a more conventional uh, plugin? Me personally, I would prefer it because I'm more onto that side of uh, developing uh, add-ons. Uh, but we will see uh, what will be, let's say, uh, reaction to this, whether more of people would be interested of having such a tool. So we might decide to put more gears on that and uh, maybe turn it to separate add-on. You can just download and, and uh, use it in Blender. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Uh, maybe on this topic you may also want to be in the discussion tomorrow for about add-on development. Because okay. I think one of the main reasons why people choose to do this in, in C++ or C and not in Python is because of the speed. And when you say you have to go through a terabyte of data, it's, yeah. So maybe there should be some plug uh, plug-in structure for Blender to allow fast data transfer. Yes. <laughs> Uh, one comment, uh, I like Blender because it uses the Python and C++ and I don't know uh, who knows the S pointer in Python. No, nobody. It's, it's great, great, great because uh, each object in Python has the S pointer which uh, is the pointer into memory of C++ structures or respective C structures. It's very, very useful. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Does your approach support implementation of the language data? Not right now. Repeat the question. Yeah, first. yeah. Uh, the question was whether our plugin supports uh, dynamic uh, data. Uh, well, not right now. Uh, basically, we so far we were working with uh, just uh, uh, one-time uh, shot 
of, uh, of a data. Yeah. Can you shout your question or? It's going to be a little bit rude considering I'm at a Blender conference, but have you considered other software like, for example, Goudini for this task? Uh, since uh, Goudini has a lot more visualization options and it has a node structure which uh, allows more freedom in terms of how you want and what you want to visualize. Uh, isn't Houdini paid software? Uh, Goudini has Python support. <laughs> Houdini has Python support. Well, we simply wanted to use totally open source uh, kind of stuff because we are a national organization and we are at the university, so that's why. Thank you very much. <laughs> so now up is Mike Simpson. So we have to do the last switch of today. So, um, as I said, uh, I'm, my name is Mike Simpson, and I am um, a research software engineer from Newcastle University. Um, the team works with various partners across the entire university, but my main job <laughs> is to work with um, Nick Holloman, who is the professor of visualization um, at Newcastle. And so I'm working on a number of projects with him focused around um, data visualization, obviously. And um, Blender is one of the main tools that we've been using for that. Uh, so what I thought I would do today is just show you three examples of some of the visualizations that we're currently working on using Blender. Um, and yeah, just give you um, a, an idea of some of, the, some of those uh, projects. Um, but first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the background for the project. So we work with a group called the Urban Observatory at Newcastle, and they've got access to um, hundreds of sensors all across the city measuring things like temperature, rainfall, and air quality, um, and that sort of thing. And um, we've been working with them for a while. We've got uh, this um, 3D model of the city that we purchased from our colleagues at Northumbria University. And what we're trying to do is display the Urban Observatory data in a sort of interesting and engaging way. And we did some initial visualizations like this one where we've just taken the 3D model, treated it as a map, and overlaid the um, sensor data on top of it. Um, so that's a sort of basic example of, the, of one of the earliest projects that we did in Blender. Um, you'll have an idea that this is a slide from a slightly long, elongated um, presentation, but we basically do as much as we can in an automated way. Most of it is done with Python scripts. We haven't got to the point of writing plugins yet, but that is something that we're working on for further down the line. Um, it's running these scripts to process the data that we've downloaded from the Urban Observatory and to generate these um, visualizations automatically. So the first thing I want to talk about was a video called Living Cities that we made, which is now um, published on YouTube, I think. It's certainly on YouTube, but I don't know if it's made, made public yet. Um, and what we were trying to do was to use data from the Urban Observatory to tell um, data stories in an informative and engaging way. And we're looking at, in this case, how the, um, when they run the Pride March in Newcastle every year, they close down quite a lot of the roads in the city center and what effect does that have on um, air quality and Obviously, when you get rid of all the cars, the air quality dramatically improves, but we wanted to try and show that in a slightly more interesting way. So I've got, if I can find it, a video here. So this has been done entirely in Blender. Some of it is animated manually and some of it is generated um, automatically based on the data source. I can move that. So we start off by sort of zooming in. We zoom into the UK. I won't show you the whole video because we haven't got time. Um, let me zoom into the northeast and the, these are images taken off the Open Observatory website, so the image is on planes, but um, most of the rest of it is done in Blender. So that's an example of uh, sort of the sensor network that we've got across the city out for the coast from the airport. Um, and so we'll sort of talk about some of the data. We can look at trends in the data source, and again, we've written some, uh, one of our researchers has written this code, which turns the CSV data into bar graphs and things. 
slightly unnecessary, but we wanted to be able at some point to, to make this video 3D, and we thought it would have more impact if the graphs were actually three-dimensional. Um, and these look at sort of general trends in um, air quality and points out that there are several times over the course of just one day where the uh, sort of pollution levels are exceeded in our city. Then we zoom in and we finally get to the 3D model. We can overlay some data on top of that. And, uh, let me show you that. We zoom in to focus on the pride area or the area where the march runs, which is this route here. There's a slightly, um, slightly motion sickness induced section where we fly around <laughs> the city, which I won't show you that because it, it does quite scary on a big screen. Um, <laughs> and then what we're trying to do is overlay some data. So some, I say some of this has been done by hand, um, but we're looking at automating bits like this. So the sensor locations are all generated automatically from CSV data. And then we've tried to show visually how the air quality changes over time. So what we've got is these sort of circular circles around the cliffs, which sort of get bigger and smaller as the air quality changes. So you can see there's a sort of very big dip, and this is while the roads are closed for the Pride March, and then it goes back up again afterwards, and we're combining that with the graph. And then we've got sort of a few more graphs talking about the difference between the parade route and the rest of the city and that sort of thing. And then quite a cool bit at the end where we're presenting our conclusions where we've got this sort of um, transition showing sort of daylight over, over the city. So that's one example of how we use um, Blender to try and um, tell engaging stories. That's nothing particularly new or revolutionary. You'll have seen those sorts of things before. It's mostly um, sort of standard animation stuff. Uh, but I also wanted to show you a couple of slightly more complex um, projects. So the first one is called Terrascope. Actually, I will just, I'll, I'll show you this as well because that's much easier than talking about it. So we've got this image of the city, which again has been generated from the same data set and the same uh, 3D model of the city. Um, but what we've done is created this, it's an enormous image, so it's in it comes in different sort of layers, but the base image is a million pixels along each edge. We think it's one of the largest uh, sort of digital images of uh, any city in the world that's ever been produced. Um, why would we do that? You might ask, and it would be a very good question. Uh, but the point is that we're trying to show data about the city on different scales, so we can look at the sort of scale of the city, or we can zoom in and look at the area around the um, campus where we work or we can zoom right into the level of our building and this is the building where we work which is why we've got access to some of the uh, sensor data from this uh, brand new building and I can actually zoom into the level of our floor, that's my office there. I can zoom into the point where we can see my boss's office um, and actually I, if, I don't think the data sources are connected anymore but you used to be able to tell when they, people were in their office by the NO2 levels and how they change over the course of the day but somehow the lecturers didn't like that so that's been turned off. But <laughs> You can see how we can sort of visualize the um, data about the city in a sort of interactive way on a very large scale. Um, the way that we do this oh, I don't get there. Um, is by um, uploading it to cloud. So we use Microsoft Azure, we upload the model, it gets set out to a number of different nodes on the cloud, um, the images get rendered and then stitched back together. I say it's a trillion pixel image and it's the equivalent of 65,000 4K images all generated on different nodes and then uh, stitched back together. Uh, if we use 128 nodes, it takes about 24 hours to render this image, and if we do it on 1,024 nodes, it takes about two hours, um, which gives you an idea of the scale. It costs about £5,000 every time we want to redraw this image, which sounds like a lot, and it is, <laughs> but if you compare that to the amount it would cost to buy the equivalent hardware to sit in the building and actually be able to run this in-house, it's actually uh, quite a dramatic saving. So that's one uh, example of... Um, a slightly more complicated project that we're working on in Blender, and if anyone's interested in reading more about that, there's a link to, I don't know if we can share the slides, but if you can get access to the slides, there are links at the end. Which I'm, I'm sure if you want to have some links in the description of uh, this yeah, talk and the schedule, then we can make that happen. Yeah, I can put the links somewhere, then you'll be able to read the papers which have just been published on this. And then finally, um, the other project we're working on at the moment is trying to visualize uncertainty, or what, what we're really doing is visualizing additional data um, inside these uh, visualizations. So we'll be looking at the, the glyphs that we've designed to represent the data in the scene. Um, they are a sort of colored circle which represents the value and changes color depending on the value. And then you've got this white circle and the black circle. The main purpose of that is obviously to distinguish it from the background so that you can read it more clearly. But we did think, could you show an additional dimension of data um, using that same system? So we thought we'd uh, try and change the way that the white shape works to represent, in this case, um, uncertainty. 
so we came up with this idea of sort of linking uncertainty to visual complexity. So uncertainty is a very complicated thing to explain, and I'm not very good at explaining it, so I won't go into too much detail, but it's a measure of how confident you are in the accuracy and reliability um, of your data. So we've got the system where if you're sort of high level of confidence, it's a straight line, a very simple shape, and then this line gets more wibbly, technical term there, as you um, become more uncertain about the values in your data. And so based on that, we've created a series of glyphs which include uncertainty, so we've got the sort of least uncertain on the right, on the left, sorry, most uncertain on the right. And we're running a number of tests at the moment. I think there's a paper that was published a few weeks ago, which I've concluded a link to at the end as well, um, which shows how users have responded to this when we've uh, tried to use it in person, because we've now replaced some of the, um, the systems and overlaid it. Um, I think that was most of what I wanted to say. I say we're working on turning it into a proper plugin for Blender. We're working on uh, integrating it with Microsoft Power BI, so you can create a dashboard that calls out to Power BI in the background, uh, to Blender in the background, and returns the resulting image inside Power BI. And g generally, trying to automate as much of this process as possible, including things like making sure the glyphs are always facing the camera and um, laid out sensibly. And that's pretty much it. So that's just a couple of examples of how we use Blender for visualization at Newcastle. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I had a question about, I noticed that the glyphs here are all, they look like they're vector images. Uh, they, are they vector graphics? That is a very good question. I think the geometry is generated in R, but I mean they are, they are three-dimensional objects. They're sort of made of cylinders, and they, I can't remember how the white shape is generated. But So uh, my, my question, other than that, was um, <laughs> you're, you, you're lying on a very large rendered pixel image, mm. and um, w would it be easier possibly to use vectors just to, you know, for, to, to visual, for visualization? Is there, a, um, is there a reason that it's, it's pixel data instead of vectors? Uh, good question. I'm not sure what the answer to that is. Um, oh, okay. Was, okay. Um, I've sort of been, been brought onto this to, um, it was an existing project that I've been brought onto, I'm not sure what the origins were. I think we've got this 3D model of the city and we're just trying to use it for interesting and cool things. I guess. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, thanks. No more questions. <laughs> then you have a question. Um, where does the uncertainty come from? Is it from the sensors itself um, or? So we had some discussion with the um, scientists who run the urban observatory, and they said one of the ways they measure the reliability of the sensors, because some of them are brand new, very expensive, high quality sensors, and some of them are cheaper ones, or they're getting towards the end of their life. And apparently as some of the sensors get towards the end of their life, they produce a sort of bigger variance of results. So in this example, we're using the variance in the data coming out from the sensor, which suggests that that one on the corner of the pointy building, for example, might be, um, unreliable or sort of at the end of its life. Okay, thank you. So it's, in this case, it's variance, but we could use any measure of uncertainty. It depends on the application area. And can we find this graph, bar graph drawing stuff somewhere online? <laughs> Not yet. We've, it's sort of in GitHub, but we're in, the, we're in the process of sort of open sourcing it and trying to fix some bugs. Um, so it will be available at some point, we hope. Great. But thank you. So then I give the word to Adam. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, need to switch the presentation. Okay, hello everybody. My name is Adam Kalisch, um, and in the next 10 minutes, I would like to introduce how I am using Blender for my research. Um, the slides, by the way, are online, so you can um, watch it live. Um, yeah, I will start with a brief introduction, and then I will give you some examples of Visual Slam, sensor data fusion, and machine learning, and I will uh, conclude my presentation with some yeah controversial statements. Okay, um, I'm currently a PhD student at the Friedrich Alexander University in Germany, in um, Erlangen, and I'm mainly focusing on monocular visual slam and sensor data fusion. This is what we do at the 
Yeah, at the department at university, so we um, focus our research on the uh, localization and um, navigation of autonomous robots. You can see in the video some um, projects from our students where we also use machine learning to, of course, localize objects in the 2D image and then later put them into a 3D map of the environment. Uh, I will not show the whole video because, um, yeah, you can see the slides online. Um, in 2017, I already gave a talk on how um, Blender is being used at two universities in Germany. And at the end of the talk, I, I introduced um, that I will start my bachelor the my master thesis, sorry, um, about um, yeah, 3D reconstruction based on machine learning. And I also said that I wanted to include it into Blender if it's somehow possible. Um, it turned out that the topic changed uh, to something uh, quite similar, which is the fusion of Visual Slam and GPS. And this is what my talk will be about today. Um, yeah, the question is, what is Visual Slam? Visual Slam is, as you can see here in this video, is a, a way or an algorithm where you can use a camera and you can um, localize that camera if this camera moves and you can simultaneously build a map. So SLAM stands for Simultaneous Localization and Mapping and Visual SLAM is uh, the version where you use cameras to do that. And many of you might know that we have this already in Blender included. Um, this is called the Motion Tracker. And here you can see that usually you start with tracking features. So you pick specific pixels in your image and then you try to um, yeah, find correspondences between image sequences or across image sequences. And um, this approach that we have currently is, um, is abstracting the image into feature space. So you basically get rid of all the pixels and only keep those that you have already tracked. And um, it continues with, um, you have your two cameras, for example. The red dots visualized here are the feature correspondences, so basically your tracked features. And then there are algorithms that can estimate the camera transformation, so basically how do we get from one camera to the other, and also estimate the 3D position of those feature points here visualized in, in blue. And what Blender does internally is it tries to um, get this estimation projected into one camera. This is the green dot and then tries to minimize this error, this um, geometric error um, between those feature points. And um, this is also what you see when you have the solve error in Blender. So minimizing this error is one method and what you usually get from this is yeah, a very sparse point cloud. Um, so only those features that you picked are usually tracked. And the sequence before was from Hollywood Camera Works. Um, it's a standard example when you want to um, integrate objects into your scene. Um, the other method that I have investigated, um, not the indirect method, is the so-called direct method. And the direct method does not look at uh, the geometric error of those feature points but it looks at the so-called photometric error. Photometric error means you have um, two images with intensities, so basically the brightness of, of a pixel, and then you try to um, find an estimation of a camera and 3D structure so that those intensities match and they um, subtract to zero. And those are two methods that can be used, but both of them are not perfect. And in my research, I investigate what is influencing the robustness of such systems. And therefore, I used Blender for generation of the data sets, which you can see here. So there's a trajectory that I, um, how I move the camera in the scene. And by using this, I know what is my ground truth. So what is my reference trajectory? And then I can later compare them. And what I have found, for example, is that um, if I take the camera and I and I only translate it, so I do not rotate it in turns, for example, then uh, the reconstruction is quite good, as you can see. So it um, yeah, is quite close to the reference. But if you take the camera and you also rotate it, then you 
get a result that suffers from drift. So investigating those factors, how they influence your estimation, is what I find quite um, um, interesting. To solve those issues, we usually can use an approach which is called the sensor data fusion. We already um, heard that we have several sensors that we can use, and the same is true with sensors that can measure our localization. And such a sensor could be GPS, for example. So here in Blender, I have an, an example implementation of how sensor data fusion could work. In black, you have your reference trajectory. So this is how uh, the camera is animated in Blender. Then in red, you have your GPS measurements, where you know the, um, yeah, the uncertainty of. And in, uh, in light blue, you have now the trajectory that was estimated from the visual uh, SLAM algorithms. And in green, you have the outcome or the result of the sensor data fusion. And also visualized is the uncertainty of your position, which in this case is um, vertical because we only measure X and Y as the position and not the vertical position. And this is quite interesting to, um, to investigate how this is actually, um, how the results are, and we can directly visualize it in Blender. And Blender can also aut automatically create plots for us that we can use in our um, research later. As the last example, I'm, I want to quickly talk about machine learning. And machine learning is an interesting way to learn, to let, robot, ro to let robots learn um, how to understand the environment. And I recently faced an issue with that because you usually need a lot of training data. And um, what do you do if you have objects where there's not a lot of training data available? And let's take, for example, the Suzanne that we know all. And we want to classify this Suzanne. So this tool is able to first visualize you uh, what your bounding boxes are, so what is the actual classification and detection capability as a perfect um, version. And then Blender can automatically create you the data set for that by just varying several factors that you want to analyze how they influence your machine learning um, outcome. And this is an overview of what can be generated. Of course, all of you know we can make a lot with Blender. So. About my conclusions, um, first, I think that it is interesting to think about the idea of implementing or integrating those direct SLAM methods more into Blender, because direct methods can also reconstruct you not only corners and blobs, but also edges, for example. And by having those reconstructed, we can get a richer point cloud where, can, uh, where we can use that to integrate uh, objects into a video, for example. Um, we should also combine ideas from both the rendering world, or image synthesis, and image analysis, computer vision. Because if we could try to, or if we could accomplish to integrate them very tightly, that, for example, I render an image, and then I directly use this rendered image to analyze it and to reconstruct the 3D world, if we can provide such a pipeline that works, um, I think it would be very interesting. And uh, last but not least, the synthetic data, I think it's a very um, good way to, to evaluate algorithms, to, to train them. But of course, uh, many people think that we should not use synthetic data um, for those tasks. Yeah, before I end, a short um, um, yeah. welcome to everyone who's in Germany, in Nuremberg, to just visit our Blender user group. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Some was wondering why would you not want to use synthetic data? Or because that's the only thing you can really control and measure, right? That's true. That's also what I think. But synthetic data is um, very ideal. Of course, you can um, create realistic renderings. Um, 
but all of those are still an approximation to our real, real world. Still, of course, if we can manage to create very photorealistic uh, results, then of course that's the way to go, I think, yeah. I suppose you use synthetic data to test uh, everything. Yes, but also to train, as you saw in the machine learning yeah, yeah. example. And uh, training with synthetic data is not create, not not like um, mapping the real world. No, of course. That's the problem. Yeah. 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 Is there any any? Um uh, studies to the effect of training a neural network with uh, synthetic data yes. and then applying it to the real world. We're currently about to um, make pub publi to publish results, but there are already results. Yeah, w also where Blender was used. Cannot cite the paper at the moment, but there are um, works. Yeah. I wanted to ask a similar question: whether there is some, let's say, comparison between uh, quality of training of uh, uh, or, or on uh, some real data uh, compared to simulating data? How are the results? Yes, this is also um, in those papers. Uh, in our research, we found that if we train only on synthetic data, we get up to an accuracy, that's the mean average precision, MAP score, of 0 0.5. So 40% accuracy on only synthetic data in our um, examples. The problem is, if you don't have a lot of training data, you also don't usually have a lot of data to evaluate on, because you want to evaluate your models on real data, of course. So that's a bit of, uh, yeah, it's difficult to say. Yeah. I will repeat it, yeah. Um, we currently, I personally use supervised methods at the moment. Unsupervised methods are also interesting and also like um, semi-supervised. Um, so the difference maybe for everyone is um, supervised you know what is your reference and then you train on that. On supervised you, you usually um, use other measures of uh, comparing that. So not directly, for example, the bounding boxes but um, other data you can compare to. So the question was, do we use supervised or unsupervised methods? Well, in that case, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Peter. <laughs> yes, uh, the air conditioning has been turned on. So it should cool down a little bit, but yeah. Maybe they will. <laughs> There's the kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> they do have a pumpkin for Halloween already. So. <laughs> but we can leave this one open and live with the noise for a bit, right? That's okay for you? Can you still understand me with the noise? Good. Is that okay? Yeah, fine by me. So great, that means the last 30 minutes are for me. <laughs> Not really, I won't. So I uh, won't introduce myself anymore. Just wanted to say two things. One is the place that I work at, Sir Sarah here in Amsterdam, is more or less a high performance computing center, although that's a little bit too simple. We do a bit more than that. So the people I work with, are, my group works for, is mostly scientists, people that do data analysis, stuff like that. Uh, and recently we remodeled our office, so lots of uh, glass walls everywhere. And uh, of course they asked the visualization guys to provide some visuals. So we fired a blender, took some data sets, and what you see over there is all made in Blender, high resolution renders, and it looks really nice. And I think everybody's happy with it, so good. Okay, so one of the things my group does is uh, we have this course uh, where we basically allow researchers and scientists to uh, learn Blender, see how they can load their data sets into Blender, make nice renders, etc. This is within Europe, there's a lot of interest to this, so we, we try to keep the course uh, at least two times a year. Um, but one of the things that we always get is how do we use volumetric data in Blender? 
because this current support doesn't appear to be optimal. Right, and lots of scientific data is volumetric. And there's different types of volumetric uh, grids. Grids that have, for example, varying spacing, like in the top one. Uh, grids that adapt to the thing that you're simulating. Grids that are hierarchical, etc. Um, but it appears that cycles is not up to all of those types of data. Right, so I think the, the regular grid fits in there, but... Hmm. And then loading that data isn't clear either. How do you do that? Is there a common format to do that or not? We're not entirely sure. We've done some testing. Doesn't seem to be easy. Um, and we understand that volumetric rendering might not have the highest priority in Blender development. Uh, there's all kinds of topics that they want to work on, so that's fine. Um, by the way, this happened yesterday evening on Twitter. Apparently, Stefan Werner is tomorrow going to have a talk suddenly in the schedule uh, about volume rendering in cycles, so that's going to be interesting. Uh, this wasn't there yesterday. So, uh, in my quest to see what can we fix this somehow to get better volume rendering within Blender, I uh, stumbled upon Osprey. If you're into scientific visualization, you know tools like Pair View or Visit, you probably heard of it or even played around with it. Uh, it's a library from Intel, C++ library. Uh, it's aimed at interactive rendering, so uh, high frame rates. Uh, doesn't generate the best images out of the box, but you can still create very nice images like in the bottom. There's actually two types of renderers in, so in, uh, in Osprey. One is what they call the path traces for the beautiful stuff, and then there's the Cypher's renderer at the bottom, at, sorry, at the top for the more functional images. Um, and actually, it's part of the One API framework, and it contains two components that are well known, I think, to Blender. So the open image denoise is what is being used for the 2.81 denoise node. That's the basis of it. And Embry is also being studied to see if it can uh, improve cycles performance, I think. Um, so the nice things about it, it got good volume rendering support. It got something which I call scientific primitives. I'll show that on the next slide. Uh, very interesting is that it allows you to render distributed way, so multiple nodes with multiple cores, and you can really scale up your visualization. So uh, about these scientific primitives, the nice thing about it is that they allow you to generate basically a scene or a 3D scene with, from the data directly. So if, for example, you have a point set, uh, now in Blender you could probably put that in a particle system, then model a sphere, instance that within the particle system. Uh, but then you have explicit geometry, right? You have still polygons. And Osprey allows you to render an image like that with perfect spheres that are not explicitly within the data, it's just the, the, the position and the radius, um, while still being able to color it and change the, uh, the radius. And there's different types of data that it supports, for example, volumetric data, slices on volumetric data, isoservicing, uh, and the usual stuff like triangle meshes, etc. So it's a good, uh, good basis, interesting technology. Um, and these days you see that tools like Pair Human Visit start to use Osprey, they in include it already for a couple of years. And well, the way the Pair Human people call this is this is high quality visualization. So this is different from the normal scientific visualization. It's got nicer materials like the gold stuff, it got nicer lighting, etc. So it's interesting to see those tools stepping up towards the Blender level of uh, visualization basically. But the question then becomes, well, why would you not use those scientific visualization tools for animation and rendering? Why would you want to do Blender? So I have a horrible slide. Uh, you probably agree with me. Yep. <laughs> Good. Uh, I would actually be interested from the panel, but the audience as well, for once I start explaining this, if you agree with me. Because I think Blender versus scientific visualization tools, there's a whole lot of differences between those. So first of all, Blender is focused very much on the creative usage although that might be too narrow as well. You can do very functional things in Blender. Uh, scientific visualization tools are usually about data analysis, communicating with your colleagues, etc. Um, with Blender, most of the data is well, things like 3D models, characters, etc. It's all created for a purpose, right? To maybe uh, render an animation or create a visual. While with scientific visualization, the data is probably given. It's the output of a simulation and then the visualization starts. So that's a difference. Uh, I think the scenes within SciFizz are usually a bit simpler. You have like a data set and some stuff around it, like lights, etc. Um, but the tools, especially the scientific visualization tools, are not really good in helping you do the creative stuff. So, just wondering, do you agree or do you disagree? You have a different opinion? Yeah, yeah okay, good. <laughs> uh, and one of the things is that you can teach a scientist to learn Blender. Uh, we know we've done it. But usually you cannot teach a creative guy to learn one of these scientific visualization tools. 
Yeah, they're domain specific, hard to get into, very even the Blender interface becomes easy compared to those things. <laughs> so well, so that's one. And then the secondly is, well, you, once you have scientific data, how do you get it into Blender? What's a good way? And there are personally two challenges. One is when you have a large data set, you don't always want to load it into Blender completely. It doesn't really matter, for example, if you're only animating a camera, why would you need uh, your one billion points in there? You just need like a proxy. Um, you might have volumetric data that you can't load. And you don't want to have all the scientific data within your Blend file, because that doesn't make any sense when you keep it separate. And the other one is already touched on, is you go through the Python API. Wouldn't the plugin system be better? Yes, I would definitely say so. Because going through Python and Blender scene elements and then cycle scene elements to render is a bit much. So my little experiment that I did was to render something in Osprey while controlling the camera with some scripts through Blender. And that worked really well. And then I started hacking on it for a couple of weeks and even months by now. And it turned, well, it's turned into this Blospray add-on, uh, uses Osprey for rendering, client-server architecture, I'll go into that a little bit later, and plugin system to load the data at the server side. So the client-server setup, so you got normal Blender, network connection to uh, the Blospray server, which is based on Osprey. The nice thing is you can re run it remotely, so you can run it on your HPC system close to the data, uh, on a machine with a lot of memory, a lot of CPU, etc. while the system that runs Blender can be light, you can even restart them separately, so that's easy in terms of uh, testing, etc. It has a bit of a downside. Um, there's overhead, of course. The data has to go from Blender to the server. There's latency due to the network. If the bandwidth is low, for example, on Wi-Fi, that becomes an issue. And a file over there isn't the same as a file over there. So paths are a bit of a weird thing. Uh, then something on the plugin system. So what the plugin does, it um, it gets represented within the Blender scene with a mesh, for example, the cube over there. You attach the plugin to the mesh, then set a number of parameters, which is the, the properties that you see there. When you render, all that gets exported to the server. The server creates the Osprey scene, lets the plugin do its thing, in this case, loading the data, creating an Osprey volume out of that. That gets added to the scene. Osprey does the rendering and sends back the frame buffer. So in this way, um, all the data processing and all the Osprey things are done within the server and not in Blender. Uh, this is basically a, a list of what I just said. The, the important thing is that Blender does not know anything about what the plugin does. It only has the mesh, a bounding box, or something else in the parameters. And you can do interesting things with your plugins. So I have one, for example, to use the Open Asset import library, which can pretty much load any polygonal mesh pretty quickly, much faster than most, most of the importers in Blender, which is interesting. Uh, read from an ACF5 file, generate some testing data, etc. So one example, actually two examples. This is from the University of Twente here in the Netherlands. They do a simulation on wind farms. And when you have one windmill, uh, it doesn't really disturb anything. But once you get 100 in row, uh, the turbulence of the first one starts to influence the next one, etc. So the efficiency is very hard to model, depending on the wind direction and speed. So they do this simulation. There's the reference over there. Um, this is a visualization that I did, so it's a volumetric data set, the size is up there. Uh, I have the color ramp that I abused to, uh, to set the transfer function on this volume. And this way you can still edit the, the velocity of the opacity and the colors, etc. Uh, this visualization will not be correct at this point because I haven't checked it for correctness. This also works partly already in the interactive render, although not everything there will, uh, will work as expected. So the windmills are just Blender objects, meshes. You've got the bounding box for the volume. And once you start the rendering, the Osprey render server will do its thing and send you the, the image. And basically, this is just a normal uh, cycles-like interactive render. OK, I'll stop it there. Another example. Uh, this is a data set that I showed two years ago here at the Blender conference. I was struggling then to get all these blood cells visualized in cycles, and I en ended up hacking cycles. Well, I don't have to do that anymore. So uh, one box, one plugin that loads all these data sets. So it's basically two small meshes that get instanced uh, a couple of million times, a total of 10 billion triangles, um, rendered in Osprey in under two minutes. 
And the nice thing is the Blender file stays really small because the only thing that's in there is this box object, a light and a camera, etc. And all the data is outside, still editable, and you will load it at demand. So final thing, obviously people are interested in the performance compared to cycles mostly. Uh, take the next slides with a huge grain of salt, that's what that image means, because we're comparing apples and pears more or less here. So I took the BMW testing scene from the, from the benchmark, uh, converted it because of our libraries in there, it's all objects now, so I can edit the materials. Um, obviously the shading networks that are in use cycles cannot be duplicated in Osprey because it doesn't have that. So I just picked a shader that I thought was more or less the same thing, but not exactly. Um, at the same number of samples, so 35, Osprey is about 10 times faster. However, you can see that the image is much noisier with Osprey, which is, I think, to be expected. Osprey is aimed at interactive rendering, uh, and the, the Intel guys will probably just use the denoise after this to get a better image out of low number of samples. So using a bit more samples to get to the same image quality, here's 100. Well, it's still four times faster, but still too noisy. Then at 400 samples, you start to get into the same ballpark, and then the time is more or less the same between cycles and Osprey. Uh, there is quite a bit of overhead still, because for every sample being rendered on the render server, it gets sent as an image back to Blender. And that's a bit of overhead. Yeah. So if you want to try it yourself, I've released it on GitHub. You need Osprey 2.0, which is not released yet, but you can just clone the repositories, 2.8 only. And a whole list of things that might or might not work. You can see the README if you have any more questions or ask me. Um, that's it. And finally, some thank yous because I needed quite a lot of help with this, at least information, etc. So the Osprey development team, the Dev Talk, uh, the Blender Seed uh, developer, because developing an add-on for the render engine isn't easy. So a lot of stuff hidden there. <laughs> and the two universities just gave me their data sets in order to use them. So thank you very much. Is this uh, using the Blender Render API? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, what do you expect if you get more and more samples? You would get like a better uh, shading quality compared to cycles. Oh, I don't know. I don't. It's I don't just even what I see. What I see basically, it's it's not about the the, the amount of sampling compared to the the, the sampler used. So, if you use like a Halton or use certain yep. stratified sampler, so that's why I I can see that it's it might be mainly better to imp like to pick more, you know, a mm -hmm. better sampler than just increasing the number of samples. Okay. I, I haven't looked into detail and in what Osprey does. Yeah, yeah. the it thing is, the, the support of Osprey, of course, to to path tracer is good. That we can generate, like, you know, some bit of more physics, of course, in the scene. But uh, to me, it's always like there's still a, m a missing thing, missing layer, which would actually uh, boost the uh, the, sh the shading quality compared to cycles. Okay. So that's what I wanted to, to know, whether, like, using Osprey was basically for creating visuals with stunning quality and get a bit of more performance using Osprey, or it's just because of the limited support of Blender to volumes? For volumes was, I'd say, the initial reason for looking into this. But then I started thinking about the data problems, and then the client-server things make more sense to me. And then Osprey right now is what I have. And uh, if I can get more or less to say, look, I'm not, we're not trying to make very beautiful scientific visualizations because it doesn't make much sense most of the case. It's about the data, it's not about perfect well, shading. Well, if, if it's about like outreach and getting funds, sometimes you might need to, to produce yeah, outstanding yeah. you know, yeah, but visuals. The question, the question is, would you do that for really large data sets? Because the images that you showed in the beginning were fairly simple, right? one neuron. Yeah. Uh, I remember last year's talk from you guys with the very complex yeah. uh, neural networks. Uh, the shading, I don't think it matters that much at that point. My, my impression. I mean, yeah, yeah sure. No, no. It's just to me. There, were, I don't know exactly what was the main motivation for you yep. to write sort of like plugin. Of course, Osprey. It's it's, an, it's a wonderful engine using yep. the Intel, you know, latest CPUs, which can Im like get a semi-interactive even path tracer, which was which yep. is perfect. And integrating in Blender, I won't say as an alternative to Cycle, but like one more, you know, rendering engine that would give it like a boost to people to use it really for Cyvis or yep. something like this. Yep, yep. But the main motivation for you, to me, that was like question mark. You know, I don't know okay. how this started. Okay. Yeah. Fair. Fair. 
I have another question. Sure. Um, let's say in a hypothetical future that Blender supports better um, implicit services and loading data on the fly without saving it to the Blend file. Would you still use Osprey? Probably not. No. no. The main motivation is the limitations right now in Blender. Okay. Uh, volume rendering and data, large data sets and large yeah. scenes, that's really an issue. Yeah. You can't create a million objects in Blender. It doesn't work. Yeah. Right, so this was a way around. So yep. Hi. Uh, could you back to switch to BMW? Which yeah. one? The first one, the third one? The, uh, this one, yeah. This one. Um, I know that the samples in this scene are on score. That means this is the NA ah. checkbox. And <laughs> it's not 35, but it's score. That means around 1,000 samples per pixel. OK, interesting. Uh, and what about Osprey? Uh, I don't know. Did you uh, copy configuration for the rendering? I tried, that, to, I tried to match it more or less in terms of rate depth, uh, roulette depth, etc. I tried to use the same values where possible, but it isn't. That's what I meant with it's apples with pears. You can't completely duplicate it. Right. So. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions, remarks, love notes? No. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. So, uh, as a as a question to the panel, um, what do you? Uh, how does your work environment, your university, your your where wherever you are? How? What's the vision on uh, both using and uh, contributing to open source. Well, I would say it's very positive. Uh, I think most of the publicly funded places indeed look at open source as the way to go compared to co commercial stuff. Uh, contributing back is a bit harder maybe because it takes effort and does money. And then the, the added value isn't entirely clear for them immediately. So. so as a software developer, I'm very much in favor of open source because it makes it easier for me to get, not recognition necessarily, but for, to make sure that the software is getting cited properly in any papers that it's included in, which I think is important specifically for software development. But um, the university generally seems to be in favor of open source, although th there's we s sometimes have legal issues with sharing stuff that is believed to be university IP. and. It's sort of complicated. There's been a few sort of spin-out companies from the university that have gone on to manage open source projects. Um, so it can sort of, it can work, but I'm, I'm not quite sure Newcastle's got a handle on how it's, um, how it's supposed to work. The main problem we have when it comes to these is usually when the project starts, they specify what they're producing and often persuading a PI to open source their code, particularly if it's code that they've written in the past that they're not particularly proud of. Open sourcing it can be a challenge. Um, I think it's getting better. Yeah, I have to agree with you because, um, yeah, universities usually are open and our university is, all, is also very open. But if there are projects with, you know, with industry, for example, then the industry is often the, I mean, uh, the factor that uh, it is not that easy to share um, code and results. But usually the uh, university is also building on open source projects like, for example, we do with uh, the robotics um, algorithms. They all work basically on the robot operating system on ROS. So this is open source and it's great that we have this possibility to use it. Also, of course, it's better for science if stuff is open source because it means other people can download your code and reproduce your research. And it also means you can build on things rather than having to reinvent the wheel all the time. Well, I can just agree. I have nothing more to add. <laughs> well, I might have a bit of contradicting thing in terms of open source is amazing, but it's it has to be done the right way or not to be done, which means that you write a very nice plugin, okay, and you'd like to share it. Before you share this plugin, for example, it has to be tested very well and it has to be documented very well such that any other person can really build on top of it. 
what I found sometimes, and I have also like considered that when I was building my plugin to make sure that I still give support at least for two, three years. That's one thing. And also the way it's designed to allow the users to understand where is the issue. Because some of the Blender plugins, I just click a button, Blender crashes. And then it's um, like a big, you know, question mark. Like, okay, so what's next? So most of the people say, okay, simply we just don't use this piece of software and we build our own from scratch, which would in turn, you know, would take years. And that's why I was quite happy when I received some messages saying like, okay, you know, your plugin is sort of, might be good, so we are going to build on top of it. So I told them, okay, and I give support to see, at least, it's, it, of course, every software is, is buggy and you have to go through some debugging cycles. But if the universities would like put some, so, some sort of like certain amount of budget, for example, for maintaining the software before the open sourcing and making sure that documentation is really very uh, well added, that would be the missing item which would boost open sourcing, uh, so like open source software to be used by other universities and, and other people. But, in, but essentially it's a very, very nice thing if you write some piece of code and then you share it with people. It might serve different use cases, different domains, but at the end it would still, you'll get the, uh, how to say, you'll get it in return, of course. You get cited or you get the credit of having your software, you know, being used, so it's something Hello. For my university, FOSS is, I think, way to go. And I'm pressing this very strongly, very much everywhere. So working with commercial software, which is closed, is no way to go for us. That's the kind of statement. And that's the way I see our university is doing. So I think that's. So should we teach our, our uh, computer science students and other students, should we teach them how to contribute to open source? Do you think there should be a course in that or should they figure it out for themselves? Well, you could make an argument about society in general. Should you give back in what way? So maybe within that context, you try to take at that one. But in terms of software, I don't know. People don't, kids don't even learn programming properly right now, I'd say. It's starting to become common, but it's not good enough, so I don't, I don't know. I think it's, uh, it's an essential, essential thing to teach them how to make it. I mean, one day or another, rather than just using Windows, you might like, okay, we would like to use Ubuntu, and then why do we use it? It's like we keep, would like to keep developing open source software. So if you just teach them, give them the seed where we're with which they can build on, on top of it, that would be fantastic. But if the, the thing is, how, how should you make the curriculum you know, of such course or like the approach itself to motivate them and push them in that direction, that would be the, the question that needs to be answered, I think. I, I think it doesn't even have to be like an entire course about contributing to open source, but just one class, one, one approach, yes. Um, when I was a uh, co-teacher for the uh, computer animation course in, in Utrecht, um, the students had to read certain papers and have write an essay on it. And I also told them, like, these, these papers are written by people. It's actually authors, it's people who, who are proud of their work. And if you don't understand something, just send them an email. They're, they're happy to hear about that somebody's interested in their work. So they will respond and they will explain. And some people, students' minds were, were blown. Like, oh, this is not just homework. This is actually people we can talk with, we can collaborate with. And I think some, a message like that, we should also include about open source and about um, collaborating on something instead of grabbing something from the internet that's for free and using it. It is something that's alive, that has people behind it, that a lot of thought has gone into it. And I think it's all about collaboration that can also help in the scientific collaboration as well. I have basically nothing to add to those famous words. Um, um, 
I think it's not only about the communication, it's also about like um, some people might have the exact same problem just on another part of the world where you can make a difference if you help that person to change our society and also like uh, foster the development of um, new technologies maybe. Well, um, at, uh, I was at the same university and we were also talking uh, or teaching um, programming to students and we had a special term for one thing and that was called commit angst. And that's the uh, feeling that you're fearful to commit something to a project. Yeah, like you have written the code but you don't want to commit it because everybody sees it and it's on a team and if I make an error then people will blame me and stuff and we have to teach them that it's, it's okay to commit and to put things out and they won't die if they do it. So that, that's a very important thing. <laughs> very good, thank you. Sorry, I was uh, thinking about uh, your, your last question uh, before this. Um, I was working in a university and, and I did develop some programs and I wanted to give it back to the community, but I was paid to do the research. And then when my funding for the research ended, uh, the program died, but still used. I heard last days it's still using it after five years after I left uh, at my own place, but I couldn't give it back. And I also have about 500 gig gigabytes of uh, data that I did record that I wanted to give back to the community, but I can't get any funding for that because, well, it's not research, it's giving back to the community. And there's no money in this system at the moment to give something back but what you already have, have done and developed and just get the final touches to document exactly what the data is, document exactly what all the programs are doing. And probably could have taken me about half a year just uh, and then it would have been finished. Couldn't get money for it. So uh, data is lost, programs are, uh, are not uh, uh, supported anymore. So I think there is something uh, that we need to think about as, as community. Thank you very much. I think on those wise words we have to end this because it's time. Thank you so much to our speakers. Thank you.